Hi, so my name is Philip Thompson, and I'm going to talk about distributed databases. And that is not uh, taking a database system originally designed to run on one machine and how to run it on multiple machines, but I'm here to talk about the databases that were specifically designed to run on a, a very large distributed architecture um, with that as their original design goal. So I'm a software engineer at a company called DataStax, but we build enterprise solutions for Apache Cassandra. I work full-time uh, contributing to the open source Apache Cassandra project. Uh, Cassandra is the 10th most popular database overall in terms of adoption, the second most popular in a SQL database, and the most popular of the category of databases I'm going to be talking about today. And as of Monday, I'm also now a maintainer of CCM, uh, which is the Cassandra Cluster Manager, which is a tool to play with Cassandra on your laptop in sort of a development environment. Uh, so to understand distributed databases, uh, or anything, you have to understand their design goals. And to know their design goals, you have to know sort of where you were coming from. So we have the client server architecture, and in, in an idealized image, this is what it looks like. You have your central server, it's connected to by a number of clients. Um, and that's your whole architecture. Uh, from, since we're talking about the database here, uh, and that centers your database server, and those clients are probably your application servers, which then have their own clients, which are your users. But this is, you know, of course, an idealized image. In the real world, running in production, no one has one single server sitting there. At the very least, you have a backup failover server, um, which is a hint that in the real world that this idealized image doesn't happen. Um, it's a hint that you know, this isn't a perfect architecture, but there are a lot of reasons why you want, may want to move off with having one server connected to by all your clients. So why would you distribute at all? Um, there's load. If you have your central server, it's got eight cores, 32 gigabytes of RAM, five terabytes of hard drive space, and then your, some great thing happens to your business and you find out next week you're gonna have twice as many users. Can you just give that machine 16 cores 64 gigabytes of RAM and 10 terabytes of hard space, will that handle twice as much load? No, it won't. Now, how much more load will it handle? Like, I can't tell you and no one can tell you. There's really, maybe it'll be 90% more, maybe it'll only be 25% more. Um, it depends on your application. Um, and that also <coughs> depends on how far up the scale you are. Eventually, there's a place where you cannot double your single machine uh, to handle twice as much load. And so that unpredictable increase of load um, oh, and then also doubling all those numbers, does that machine cost twice as much? No, it probably costs three, four times as much. If you double that again, eventually you're going to get into, you know, you had a $10,000 server and you're going to be running, you know, one of those million dollar um, server setups from EMC. I mean, that scales financially really poorly and then load really poorly. There's really diminishing returns there. Wouldn't it be great if you could just add a second identical machine, handle, you know, it costs exactly twice as much and it handles exactly twice as much load? That would be perfect from a business standpoint and from an ops standpoint. You know exactly what you're going to need to do to handle your increase in load. Um, failure, uh, the reason in the real world we have um, that backup machine is because, you know, if your machine goes down, that's, you know, bad. Um, so for some people, you know, you hear we should get rid of all our single points of failure, you're like, well, that'd be nice if I had time, but I'm not really ever gonna get around to that. But there are some businesses um, on both ends of the spectrum, for example, Amazon, every you know, minute they make a million dollars if the website's down an hour, that's an unacceptable loss of revenue. That's you know, the salaries of their entire ops team who are keeping the server up. Why not just hire a whole another ops team if they can prevent one outage a year? Or um, if you work at Cerner and your healthcare application running on, you know, you know, some sort of machine goes down in a hospital and 10 people die, that's just as bad, uh, but for different reasons. So having an architecture that is designed to remove as many single points of failure as possible is fantastic. And then from our standpoint, you know, most of us are software developers, but I'm sure some of us have dealt with the ops 
um, have at least some of the time, maintenance becomes completely trivial. Uh, if, when you have one machine, if you need to bounce that machine to upgrade the operating system or upgrade you know, anything, that's downtime you're introducing yourself intentionally. And that's something we were just trying to avoid for having accidentally, you know, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Wouldn't it be great if maintenance could be done at your leisure? You know, if you didn't have to wait until like, you know, the middle of the night to bounce this machine if you're the sort of company while your users are having your day, if you're an education company. Um, and also from Alps point of view, wouldn't it be great if you didn't get paged when machines go down anymore? You know, if five o'clock on Friday, you know, afternoon, uh, something dies and you can just wait until Monday at night to fix it, that'd be fantastic. You know, if you had one machine or one machine and a backup, if one of those goes down, that needs fixed immediately because all of a sudden you're introducing either a loss of revenue or an immediate um, risk of failure. And feel free to interrupt with questions at any time. Uh, so we moved to master slave architecture. Um, we recognized we needed more than one machine, uh, so why not grab two to 10 machines? But there are a lot of problems with the master slave. So master slave architecture, you have machines that are mirrors of each other. There's one machine, it is the master. There are some number of other machines. They're the slaves. They are exact replicas of the master machine. What typically, what happens is all writes, uh, all new data goes to your master, this for a database specifically, then all reads you'll pull off the slaves. But that introduces issues like slave lag. If the amount of data going into your master, uh, even somewhere near approaches the amount of data it's able to push into your slave, you're gonna start getting things like slave lag, which is where your slave is a couple milliseconds behind uh, <coughs> your master machine. Uh, but if that's not something you're able to catch up on because you have extra bandwidth, that's only going to increase. And you have things happening where you're running a MySQL master slave architecture where every month you have to take a drive, fill it with data from your master, walk it over physically to your slave machine, and then use that data because reading from a hard drive is faster than that bandwidth. That's terrible, but that's something that happens. Um, like that actually happens in the real world. Companies have to ship drives to catch up on slave life. Uh, scaling, what happens if your one master can no longer handle all of your insert load? Then you need two masters. Uh, and the minute you move past one master, uh, the synchronization between those uh, starts to run into um, a huge problem, which I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. Um, so you're really limited in the number of machines you have in a master-slave architecture, which affects you know, that load problem we were talking about earlier. And so what happens when you have multiple masters? Uh, you run into issues with the cap theorem. So the cap theorem uh, is presented by a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley, Eric Brewer, in 2000 at the Symposium on Principles of Distributed Computing. And what it is, it's uh, CAP, C-A-P, which stands for consistency, which is not the same consistency as an ACID, uh, which is uh, ACID transactions, which are an important thing in databases, but not completely related to this talk. So consistency here is defined as your whole cluster, where a cluster is defined as your entire architecture, you know, every single one of your machines running this database, agrees that there is one up-to-date copy of information. Uh, so if I have, if everyone in this room were a machine, um, you know, if you were a node in a cluster, and if I asked you all the same question and you all gave me the same answer, that would be consistent. If even one of you hasn't caught up yet, um, <coughs> maybe you were in the bathroom when I told you this piece of data and you came back, now the whole cluster is inconsistent. Um, the A is for availability, which means does the node respond? Um, does this machine respond to queries. And the P is for partition tolerance, uh, which is can your architecture handle when all of your nodes aren't in perfect communication? Um, and the CAF theorem, to do the whole theorem absolutely no justice, says to pick two. You can only have two of these things. Uh, you cannot have all three at once. And I can explain that. Um, and I was going to do it on a whiteboard, but that's 
too much work to go all the way over there. So if you have two nodes, um, so we'll think about a hard partition first. You have a node, a machine. It's here in Kansas. And then you have another node. It's in London. And the internet link between the Atlantic gets severed. Um, those nodes are now partitioned. So what happens when you communicate with one of them? Well, you have to choose C or A. That's what partition, that's what the CAP theorem says, is when you have partitions, you can only choose C or A. And what does that mean? That means either the node says, I am not communicating with every other node, I cannot answer you, in which case you're choosing C at a loss of A. Or it says, I will communicate with you as long as you understand that the other node is not getting this information. So the minute you write data, you introduce inconsistency. That's choosing availability over consistency. Um, but it's more than just a hard partition. It, if you think of partition partitions as latency, if I have two nodes and there, there's five milliseconds between them, um, so it, you know, it takes 10 milliseconds for me to send you data to get your acknowledgement, there is a 10 millisecond partition between those two nodes always. So what happens is when you do it right, you have to choose C or A. Choosing C means you wait the 10 milliseconds for both nodes to sync before you get your acknowledgement. Choosing A means you wait for the node you wrote to to acknowledge, and you understand that 10 milliseconds later, the other node is synced up, but you had already gotten your acknowledgement. That's choosing A. So what happens if we think of partition as latency? Availability becomes performance. Every single right now, you can choose to introduce a 10 millisecond delay to get consistency, or you can choose to not have that delay uh, to get availability, which is to get performance. Uh, so systems which choose availability over consistency are able to get incredibly fast write speeds, the kind that you just cannot get on a distributed architecture uh, with a system that chooses consistency. You know, millions of transactions per second going into these machines. Uh, but what happened is you, all of a sudden, you're not choosing consistency anymore. So that means, because we're not talking about two machines or three machines anymore, we're talking about a 1,000 node cluster. There's a cluster where you have 1,000 servers, separate machines, each running your database. They are all you know, nodes communicating, and they all do not have the same copy of data anymore. You wrote to one, and if, if I write a piece of information, you know, send it to a node, you are going to read. You're going to try and read that same information. Who knows what you'll get in that 10 millisecond window. So that 10 millisecond window is called eventual consistency. You no longer have immediate, strict, strong consistency. Those are all terms used to describe it. So eventual consistency uh, is what we've chosen to embrace uh, in distributed databases. And um, uh, so Netflix gave a presentation called Eventual Consistency is Not Hopeful Consistency. Uh, because a lot of people, a lot of business people, you hear eventual consistency, and you hear the word eventual, and you get really nervous. Because eventual to you means you ask your lazy friend to do something, and he says, I'll do it eventually. And that could mean in 10 minutes, or tomorrow, or never. You know, he's just never going to do that. Uh, but what eventual consistency really means here is you're accepting that, that latency window, only that latency window, as a brief a window of inconsistency, at, during which point your users can perform reads that have not gotten data, which other people have had acknowledged as successful writes yet. Um, so that's measured in milliseconds, um, but it is a real window, and you have to architect, when using these databases, you have to architect your data model around that. Um, so there are a lot of real-world systems that use eventual consistency. Um, systems that you might think strong consistency would really matter. For example, banks. Um, your checking account is eventually consistent. There are transactions which are pending, and after a couple days, they will be posted. You know, that is eventual consistency. It's, I'm pretty sure this is your balance, but I just might not have gotten all the transactions yet. Even ATMs are eventually consistent. They're choosing availability first. That's why you have a withdrawal limit on your debit card, because that ATM is not always sure what your balance is, and so they're willing to accept a maximum loss 
of what's you know if you're withdrawing those five hundred dollars, if it thinks your balance is some large number but really it's zero, they're they're willing to take that loss of five hundred dollars, um, because they're choosing availability over consistency. Um, so. When I talk about distributed databases, all of these distributed databases are NoSQL databases. Um, the big three are Amazon's DynamoDB, uh, Apache Cassandra, and then React. And I don't have much familiarity with React, uh, but both React and Cassandra are originally based on Dynamo. Yeah. So what does it mean to design with partition tolerance in mind? Uh, so these kind of databases, they're not treating partitions as the exception, they're treating partitions as the rule. They're treating communication as the exception. Uh, because when we talked about that latency as a partition, so if you treat that you're always in partition, because you are, you always have at least some latency between machines, uh, you make really different choices. You get things like log-based writes. Uh, so I'm no longer rewriting over the same piece of data um, physically on disk, because I know I'm getting writes from users and then I'm going to be getting writes from other nodes that got writes from users on that same piece of data, and they're going to be coming in at different times, and honestly, I'll just deal with it later. Uh, so you get literally an append-based write system, where if I say update table users, um, set last name equals Thompson or first name equals Philip, um, I'm just going to write that down at the bottom of my log. I'm not going to go up in my table to where it said that, um, then if other nodes are getting uh, you know, the same update on the same key, it's just going to keep appending that, and I'm going to deal with that later on the read. Um, so that's why you see Cassandra specifically having write speeds in you know, less than a millisecond and read speeds up to 15 milliseconds, because it has to go through all of those updates and figure out which one is the consistent copy, which one is the newest, most up-to-date copy. You get clusters that are masterless, uh, so you no longer have one or two machines that can accept writes. Any one of these machines in your 1,000 node cluster can take writes, and that's awesome because that means you can add machines whenever you want. You can drop them into your cluster, scaling becomes super easy, and you can take machines out. Now, more importantly, if no machine is important, you know, any machine can come out, any machine can go in, that makes operations way more trivial than they were in a master-slave architecture, where you could remove any slave node whenever you want, essentially, uh, but master nodes, you know, were not sacred, but it's a lot more work to pull a master node out of a master-slave architecture. You have to elect a new master, make sure everything's working, and then pull it. And you get, you know, unbounded horizontal scaling. Uh, there are no 1,000 node master-slave clusters out there, you know. Um, but there are 1,000 node Cassandra clusters running in production, you know, just fine. It's something completely achievable. Um, because, you know, as we talked about, it, those problems we solved at the or we had at the beginning, uh, scaling your load, now if you want to handle twice as many transactions, you just tw twice as many machines. You get perfect linear, perfect, you know, 98%, 95% linear scaling. You know, you double the number of machines, you're getting almost exactly twice as many uh, transactions that you can handle. Now, failure, we've removed a single point of failure because by choosing availability over consistency, we can accept that machines are down and we can take writes into the cluster even though machines are down. Uh, where down could be, I couldn't talk to it for 30 milliseconds because of a network, network issue, where the machine crashed and, just crashed and it's not coming back for two hours. Um, because the cluster uh, has accepted consistency for that data on the remainder of the machines, um, but it was it and you are okay with the fact that there is not a consistent copy on that last machine, obviously because it's down, because you wanted that availability. You wanted the Apple, you wanted the database to keep running no matter what. Now, and then maintenance, you can take any machine out and do whatever you want and put it back out now because we had all failures so well. Uh, so, I work specifically with the Apache Cassandra project. Um, it's a database that was started by Facebook to handle their messenger system. Uh, that was in 2008, so it's now six years old. 
Um, so if you used it more than two years ago, it is incredibly different now than it was then. Yeah. So we maximize availability at the cost of consistency absolutely everywhere we can. Um, because availability is performance in these databases. You're able to do really different things because you made these sacrifices. Um, you know, we gained that extra scaling. Uh, we gained that, re that reduced failure. Um, but there are absolutely worse sacrifices. Eventual consistency is a sacrifice in the sense that your data model has to understand that that happens. Um, so we allow users to tune their consistency level per query, and what that means is every insert, um, typically it's more every session you do, uh, but you're allowed to do it per query, is you tell the cluster how many machines you want to acknowledge your right before you get your acknowledgement. Um, so you know if you have, if you're writing to four machines, you set a consistency level of three, you write to a machine, you know, five milliseconds, five milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, uh, as soon as these three acts all come back, you get your act, and that machine will get its information 100 milliseconds later. Um, and the reverse is true on the read. You can choose a consistency level of how many machines you want to check before you're sure what the data you're getting back is the most up-to-date. Um, so you can see how uh, if we set a consistency level of quorum, that is more than half, on the right and the read, uh, pigeonhole principle, you know, CS101, there's at least one machine uh, that is absolutely up to date. So you're always gonna, you can choose to always get the most up to date information, um, but the lower you make your consistency level, the better performance you're gonna get. Um, so we get that availability as performance, um, you know, by reducing the number of acknowledgements that have to happen, uh, you can get more writes in per second, and we have that availability is that fault tolerance I talked about. Um, when machines go down, you know, they're not acknowledging, but the other machines are acknowledging, that's meeting your consistency level, and uh, you're, you know, you're accepting this. But this means the cluster now has to handle a lot of things asynchronously that a master-slave architecture didn't have to handle. Um, because by choosing to be inconsistent, we have to deal with things like compaction. Uh, compaction is where every once in a while, uh, I as a node go, man, I sure got a lot of writes um, all overlapping the same key. I'm going to compact, so I'm going to asynchronously throw out all of the old data. Um, now I don't have a huge log. I have a nice table. Um, it's now compacted. Everything there is completely consistent. Uh, there are a lot of anti-entropy mechanisms because we accept machines going up and down a lot. Uh, which is great from a user's perspective because the application never goes down. Uh, you have an issue where inconsistency uh, get, creeps in, where a machine was down, maybe it didn't get that new information when it came back up and it's inconsistent forever. Uh, so we have things like read repair, where every time you introduce a read, uh, the cluster will asynchronously, you know, you'll have gotten the new information, it'll look at all the nodes that were wrong, tell them what they should have. Uh, there are manual operations where you can rebuild all the data for a specific machine. Uh, what it'll do is it will check all of the other machines. It will ask them, what am I, what do you think I'm supposed to have? Here's what I have, and it'll figure out what's correct. Um, and it's moving a lot of work onto the cluster um, after the fact, after your transactions, which are why we're able to get that transaction performance. Um, because we're no longer handling that syncing at transaction time. Uh, so are there any questions? So how do you handle the risk of data loss if you've got some machine accepting a write and before you know, it's that partition, before it can sync with other nodes, it goes down? Yeah, so we, we, we give up consistency, but we do not give up durability. Uh, you are not going to get an acknowledgment until data is on disk. Uh, and if you said when you Typically, um, what we recommend is on your writes, you do a consistency level of quorum. So at least half the machines have gotten that before gotcha. you can acknowledge. And then you do your reads at only one. You just, you just check any machine. Um, but you will not get an acknowledgement until it's on disk somewhere. Um, so if a machine goes down, uh, that's the same as in a regular architected system. You know, if a machine goes down, 
all that data is acknowledged is still on disk for when you bring it back up. How do you communicate with a cluster? Do you tend to like only communicate with like a known node and a known address? Yeah, so the, the, the great thing you get then, I miss this, is that geographic replication. You can spread those nodes in data centers around the world. You as a user or a client server only have to connect to the closest node and it will handle replicating you know, across the world, but you can choose the lowest latency link. That's typically what happens. Um, we have, a no there are a number of Cassandra drivers which choose which node in a cluster to connect to based on both latency and what's called token awareness, uh, which means that they're going to try their best to connect to a node that they know has the data on disk. Um, because in a thousand node cluster, not every node has every piece of data. I, you set a replication factor, so um, what that means is each piece of data is on five machines out of however many machines you have. Um, so it's going to connect to one of those five machines specifically. Right, thank you. Thank you.